Hello everyone, this is Wayne. Welcome back to my channel. Today I'm here with John Ishii. John Ishii is a well-known photojournalist. He's taken a lot of photos across the world, not just here in Malaysia. If you've seen his channel, you've seen some of the stuff that he's done in Mongolia. He has some great stuff. I suggest you check out his channel. He's still growing. Not a lot of stuff there yet, but at least you can see some of his work. So John, welcome to the channel. Good to meet you. Yeah, you too, Wayne. How did we meet? Well, I think we met through uh, Chuck's uh, AP Studios, and that's where we first met. And then you had uh, uh, texted me saying that you'll be in Malaysia, and I was uh, totally thrilled. And so welcome to Malaysia and to Kuala Lumpur. Thank you, sir. And actually, John and I kind of connected before we actually met, because I had posted something on his Mongolia video, he posted something in my Mongolia video, and then when we were on the AP Studios, we realized that we've been communicating without actually meeting each other. Yeah, I was, I was quite shocked because I post uh, some comment on uh, Wayne's Mongolia video at least three, four months before I even went. Yeah. So it was uh, quite a coincidence. It was meant to be. Yes, it was. And I'm glad we finally got a chance to yeah. meet. John has been taking me around Mongolia. Sorry. John has been taking me around Malaysia and showing me the ropes, photoshops, his gear. We'll get to the gear in a minute, but I just want to talk more with John about what he's been doing in the past and what he does now. So John, tell us a little bit about yourself and what brought you to Malaysia and what you used to do in the past. Oh, okay. I, I came to Malaysia about 28 years ago. I'm originally from Seattle, Washington, and uh, I came out as a, I was a photojournalist for, for many years and worked for AFP and freelanced and done a lot of stringer work for Associated Press. And from then on, I did a lot of uh, work for Dow Jones, Wall Street Journal, and New York Times. So I've been in this uh, photography um, business as a photojournalist for oh, many, many, many years. Wonderful. So there's one thing I've been curious about. You've traveled to Mongolia quite a few times. When you went the first out, oh, when was the first time you went there, and what did you like about there? Uh, I first went to Mongolia in 2017, in November, with a group of friends, and I was so impressed by it. Um, I was addicted. Okay. Totally addicted to Mongolia. And you have seen some of your photographs of Mongolia; they look really awesome. Yes, and Mongolia is a photographer's dream. Uh, being that there's not many tourists, it's extremely extreme, so the conditions are really rough. But uh, as far as photographic opportunities, especially if you're a travel photographer or a landscape photographer or a documentary photographer or any kind, even a videographer, it's, it's one of the most uh, places where you must go. I would agree. I've been there quite a few times myself. And while I've not gone out to the western portion where, you know, a lot of the well, photojournalists, mm. I think Matt Granger have been there to, to the Eagle Festival, seen the elk and so on and so forth. And I know you've been there and done that as well. But that's, for me, as a Jamaican, cold. Way <laughs> too cold. So I want to go and check it out during the summertime. My wife's family said we should go and check it out. So maybe one day we'll head out there. Hopefully this summer, when we get back over there, we'll get a chance to do that. Well, e either way, East, Eastern Mongolia is also a beautiful place, and it's very, very similar to, I would say, to Wyoming or Montana. Oh, really? And the beauty of it is that it hasn't changed in probably a thousand years, and there's no roads, and there's no shopping centers, and, there's, and the best part is there's no fences, since they're nomadic, and people, the land belongs to the government. And that was the beauty of it, is not seeing fences. Being able to just go wherever you want to go. Exactly. No roads, just take your time, discover the country. Wonderful. I like that. So uh, Malaysia, you've been here for quite a few years. So what do you like about Malaysia? Oh, okay. I came out here about 28 years ago. And the reason was that when I was a kid, uh, I grew up here in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Uh, when I was nine years old, my father was in the, uh, he was working for the uh, uh, State Department, for the U.S. Embassy and Department of Defense. And during the 60s, uh, I was nine years old and grew up here. So I was here for about eight years. So when I decided to come back when I was in my 
late 30s, um, it was just a no-brainer. Uh, I could speak the language. I had a lot of friends here. So it was uh, quite an easy transition, transition to come here. Okay, great. I've learned a lot from John in just a few days since we've been together about his history and background and what he's been doing. And he's basically opened up Malaysia to me and take me to a couple places, Photoshop, check out some gear. As a matter of fact, we do have some gear here. We'll get into that a little bit later on. But I remember um, John had done a video, and actually I'd seen that video when you unboxed the Z9. And you were probably one of the first people in the world to unbox the Z9 on camera. So how did you get that lucky, John? Well, um there's, actually, there's a couple, couple of ways. Uh, I'm a very, very good customer of a local uh, professional camera store here in Malaysia called YL Cameras, and they have a few outlets. And uh, I've spent oh, a huge amount of money with them. So I made sure that I was on the pre-order list uh, months and months prior. So they always guarantee me that when it comes in, that I would be the first one. Now they couldn't guarantee me a date, but I was fortunate enough that it that arrived uh, on the 28th of December of 2021. So then um, I think it was just delivered uh, within two days after the official launch date. All right, because I think it was like December 24th to December 26th was the launch date. And yeah. two days later you got it. Yeah. Right. So. Uh, I was fortunate enough, and it was it was great. The they have a the camera store has a lot of influence in uh, with Nikon Asia. And I remember when we went to the store the other day, there was a lot of um, older photographers, professional guys that were in there yeah. picking up equipment. So that helps if you have a good relationship with a camera shop that can get you some equipment. That's wonderful. Yeah, they're, they're just not uh, a camera store, but they're my good friends, and the camera shop puts on events for for all brand users and then we and we have a great time so it's more of like a fellowship wonderful all right what i want to talk about now is that z9 that you have sure okay you got lucky to get one you unboxed it let me get it let me get it here i had an opportunity to play with one a bit so tell me what do you love about this camera well uh many things i i've been a nikon user for for well, at least 35, 40 years. Um, uh, when I was a photojournalist, uh, I've had the, all the D2, D2H, uh, and D4s, et cetera, all the DSLR versions. And I find it is de dependability because in my business, you cannot miss a shot. You miss a shot, you're out of a job. So it's extremely important that you have a reliable camera that you understand inside out and does not fail you. Failure is not an option in my business. You must get the shot at all costs. And this Nikon has always been uh, a, a true favor of mine. So when the mirrorless version came out, I couldn't believe my eyes. And I, when I picked it up and started to use it, I said, oh my God, this is unbelievable. I have to agree. I remember when I had it in the store and I held it in my hand, I was tempted to ask them if they had one, rip up my credit card and purchase one. I don't know, you know, because I'm traveling, it's still a little bit in the bulk side. May I? Sure. Because I testing it with a lens. I had a 28 to 70, which is a pretty heavy lens. This is the 24, sorry, the 24 to 70. This is the 24 to 120, which I think is a good lens for it. Photography-wise, I think the balance is pretty good. I like how the camera feels, whether it's in vertical or horizontal mode. And when I was in the store with that little small lens, I was like, this, this thing has a pretty good balance to it. I've heard that the video function on it is pretty great as well. Rohography um, has been shooting in some videos. He tested the 8K, actually, with the Z9, and I think it, did, it turned out pretty well. So I'd like to test it out with some video. Maybe sometime today we can do that? Sure. Okay. That'd be a lot of fun. All right. So before the Z9, what camera did you have? Uh, I had a, uh, well, I still have it. I have a, a Z6 or a Z6, uh, which I use. But on the other hand, I do have other camera systems that I use, use for different purposes. Like yeah. the Leica we had out the other Yeah, time. like the, I, I have a whole um, uh, system of Leica M cameras. 
uh, which takes me back to my uh, nos nostalgic days. And the lenses are the M lenses are absolutely beautiful. So that, but that's it's it's different. You it's not for work because uh, um, it doesn't do autofocus. It's and, manual. So that's what you want to slow. Yeah, I don't need to explain. <laughs> and I also use uh, Hasselblad, and just because I used to use it for commercial work in old 503 film cameras. So when they came out with a 907. <clears throat> That looked like a 503, I got really excited. Okay. Although it is um, not easy to use. It's, is that the one sitting right here? Yes, is, is, yeah, let me show you. It's very, very slow, but it's uh, extremely unique. It's just a little box, but it's, uh, yeah. it's just a, a gorgeous camera. And when you do take pictures with it, the colors and the Hasselblad lenses are amazing. Oh. So I, I don't use it much, but I just, I don't know. I just like touching it and feeling it and playing with it. It now, looks really cool. What else do you have? I also uh, use a Fuji system, uh, the GFX 100S, which is a 100 megapixel. And I use this uh, predominantly for uh, landscape. And it's a very slow camera, so I use it for a lot of uh, interval timing if I want to take pictures of lightnings and stuff like that. So I use it for lightning shots and landscape. And when I go to Mongolia, I use it for portraits and family shots and static shots uh, because I, I want the, the dynamic range. It has, a, I think, 16 uh, bit. 16 stops? Uh, dynamic range wow. so you can get some you can recover some incredible details in the shadows Fuji system guys I know we're all most of us are Nikon lovers but hopefully some of you guys are watching also are uh, people who love cameras in general no matter what the brands are this gentleman has been shooting for many years and he has worked with multiple different brands yes your favorite is Nikon <laughs> we have the shirt on so <laughs> I guess that's a quick giveaway right there right <laughs> So like most of us who've been shooting Nikon for years, the cameras are rugged. They get the job done. And as John says, as a photojournalist, he's been shooting Nikon for a while because you need something that can get the shot and that will work well. You did tell me a story about going someplace really cool where some of the guys out with Sony's and stuff wouldn't work. Yes. Can you relate that? Yes. Uh, for example, we were in, uh, my wife and I, my wife uses uh, uh, Leica SL system. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with it. Yeah. And in cold weather, these cameras just can't deal with the cold weather. So it was like minus 25 degrees centigrade, extremely cold. And my Nikon had no issues at all. The battery would last like all day, almost two days, even at minus 25. So that's like five degrees Fahrenheit. Extremely cold, no problems focusing, and it just never, ever skipped the beat. Now on the Leica, oh my God, you know, my, my wife was just jumping up and down, ready to tear her hair out. Uh, it would lock up and it wouldn't do, if the battery is half full, it wouldn't shoot continuously, it just lock up. Oh. So it was quite a mess. The Hasselblad, of course, in, in that condition is just, it just won't even turn on. So it's not designed for that, which I understand. Um, I many uh, not many years, but when I was in Greenland, I I had a uh, what was it called A7 Mark II, and even at minus five degrees to minus ten degrees, it also locked up and it, it wouldn't fire, and I was ex or the battery would last me twenty minutes. So luckily, I had a D4S, and that battery would last me what three days without any issues. So. What can I say? At the end of the day, professionally, you gotta have a camera that, that works. And when you're out in an area like Western Mongolia near Kazakhstan or in Greenland, there is no camera shops to go to. True. So if you drop that thing, you wanna make sure it's <coughs> strong enough to still function or at least be able to handle the conditions. Yes. Okay. So you mentioned a D2. Yes. One of the things that I want to ask about is the D850, because a lot of photographers mm -hmm. right now, and I want to kind of bring this around back to 
the Z8, because we will try to talk about thoughts of that, but not dive into too much. But one of the things we've both been seeing in chat is that people have been talking about they won't go mirrorless until they've gotten a G850 replacement. And as a person who uses things professionally, not that these guys are they're not using it professionally. I'm sure a lot of people who use a G850 are professionals and use it very well. But someone who was also using it and move over to mirrorless. You, before you went to the Z6, what were you shooting? Was it a D5? A D850. A D850. Yeah. Okay, so here's someone who can talk about the D850, the size. Tell us a little bit about the, your D850 Okay, experience. my experience with D850 um, is quite extensive because we, I had two of them. Uh, my wife uses a D850 and I had a D850. So when we used, we used it a lot when we traveled to Africa okay. to, to shoot wildlife. And we backed it up with a D500 and used 500, 600 f4 lenses from Nikon. The D850 was very, very good. The pictures are incredible. Um, I never had any issues with the D850. Although um, I did have one problem with uh, Nikon in particular because they advertised it that it would shoot 8K time lapse. Oh, yes, I didn't hear about right. that. So um, I was the first one in Malaysia to own a D850, and it was mine. I own, actually bought it and owned it. I was the first one. So when I went to the Nikon uh, Roadshow and the Nikon launch for the D850, I held it up and says, uh, you claim to have uh, 8K time lapse, but where is it? Well, apparently it can't do it cannot do 8k time lapse unless you buy their optional software ah. and that and that piece a little bit of information is in the bottom right hand corner of their brochure which is printed in light gray on white <laughs> and you almost need a microscope to read it so most people who were expecting because i did see a couple of videos one of the roach on the u.s when people were testing and they were saying that this 8k thing wasn't working and I guess at that time, no one told them that it needed additional software to work with it. Right, right, exactly. Although they did tell you, it's just that you couldn't see it. Ah, gotcha. Oh. <laughs> so that, that, otherwise, uh, not that I shot 8K time lapse, but the camera, as far as a still camera was, it was um, awesome. So I got great shots in, um, in Serengeti. Uh, doing uh, wildlife photography with it and matching it with a D500. Great. I used to have a D500. I oh, it's, uh, that, it's, it's, that thing is oh, it's rock awesome. solid. Yeah, Very I, impressive. I didn't want to sell it when I was going to travel, but I know having a Z system, since I was doing more video stuff, the Z system lenses work much better than the D500 yeah. with the F lenses. So, well, this, this yeah. is before the, the Z series ever came out. But you match a D D five hundred. You put a six hundred f four. Let's be honest, with you, it's nine hundred mm. Yeah. So if you want to catch a, a a kill with a cheetah, or an, uh, a leopard in a tree, no problem. Fantastic. Okay, so I'm gonna cut the video here. We've been talking for a bit, and this one's gonna be long. So I decided to make it to two parts. So this is part one, and part two, we're gonna talk some about the Z eight and continue the interview with John. I want to thank you all for watching. Please remember to subscribe to the channel, like, share, and comment. See you in the next one.